for to if when when there's an opportunity for everyone to uh, to speak, um, please raise your hand. And if you're on your cell phone, uh, I believe that's star nine. Otherwise, um, if you're on your computer or your laptop or your iPad, there's a raise hand function. Just use that, and then that'll help us keep everybody in queue of who uh, is going to be speaking next. And John's going to be looking after that. Uh, to make sure that uh, everybody's lined up in the right order. Um, we're gonna have a number of different votes around different issues. Uh, I'm gonna uh, put up a poll that you can vote yes, no, or abstain on. And I would encourage you to use that. Uh, and if you have any questions, just either uh, you can uh, write it in the chat or you can text me or you can uh, text any of the staff and we'll try to figure out uh, where to go from there. So over to you, John. Thanks. Good evening, uh, sisters and brothers, friends. Hope everybody had a, a restful uh, and enjoyable Canada Day with family and friends. Uh, we're calling this meeting to order now, and the roll call of officers is happening automatically because um, uh, we have that way of recording it. We The first thing up is the harassment statement. I'm going to ask Jennifer Wong to read the harassment statement. Harassment statement. Mutual respect, cooperation, and understanding are strongly held principles of the trade union movement. We will neither condone nor tolerate harassing or discriminatory behavior that creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment and undermines the dignity or self esteem of any individual. An injury to one is an injury to all. Speech or conduct which is racist, sexist, homophobic, or discriminatory in any way is unacceptable to trade unionists and only serves to divide us. Our policies and practices must reflect this commitment to equality as we work together for justice and dignity in our workplaces, our unions, and our communities. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, as we acknowledge at each of our meetings, we're meeting on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, which was subject to the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share this territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. And as we make our way through this journey around equity and respect, we need to always uh, be mindful that First Nations people since Canada was formed have been living a reality that's not of their choosing and one that does require uh, truth and reconciliation for us to build the Canada we want. Since we last met, we've had some shocking news of migrant farm workers who've come to Canada under different temporary foreign worker programs, uh, who've gone into unsafe conditions, unsafe living quarters, and hundreds and hundreds of migrant work farm workers in Ontario have been stricken with COVID and at least three that we know have passed away. So we'd ask you all to join us for a moment uh, in a moment of silence in the memory of those three brothers and everybody else who is a victim of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, the minutes from the previous meeting have been circulated. Uh, just to, again, go over the process, when you got the email this afternoon with the Zoom link, you also had attachments to a number of documents. And one of those was the minutes from the previous meeting. And those minutes have been moved and seconded. Is there any errors or omissions anybody has seen on those minutes? If there's none, then uh, we'll ask for a vote to accept the minutes as circulated. Dana, what did you call it going in here? Go in. Thank you. Um, we are expecting in a moment uh, our special guest speaker and 
just wanting uh, our staff to take a look and see if uh, if us. Brother Lee Chuk Yan has joined us yet, and that motion has been uh, passed. Just to walk through the agenda a little bit, we've got, uh, as people know, in Hong Kong right now, there's been many, many months of, of uh, mass mobilization of people uh, speaking in uh, in concern of the laws that are being passed by the People's Republic Hi, of China, and it's most recently Thank you. come. Bye. Janice, could you uh, mute, please? Yes, we could sorry. Ask people to mute their phones, uh, or actually, we should be having that as the standard to mute everybody. Um, so after uh, Lee Chuk Yan speaks, we will be going through the rest of the agenda, which includes a video from the Boston Labor Council, which is a wonderful video on. Uh, labor solidarity around Black Lives Matter. The co-chairs of our of our equity committee will start a presentation along with Brother Gobi from the library workers uh, to frame where we left off at the last meeting on racism on the front page, uh, on the front page through to some of the action statements that we've been now developing and you'll see uh, including in the links that we've got. Uh, we will have a statement on zero tolerance for racism at work. And that comes from the terrible hate crimes that we've seen in uh, construction. Uh, three situations that we've got. Hello, brother uh, from Hong Kong. Good to see you. We can see you now. Good morning. Hi. 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 Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So okay, let good. me just introduce you for one second. Uh, Brother uh, Lee Chuk Yan is the General Secretary of the Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions. He's uh, not only a trade union leader, he's been a political leader elected uh, into office in Hong Kong. And uh, when our Labor Council took a delegation to China uh, some years ago, we met with the uh, HKCTU and talked about uh, our, our mutual histories, talked about the issues that are of concern to working class uh, across this world and uh, the things that we wanted to learn from each other. And since then, of course, uh, things have changed in China. The opening that seemed to be put in place for labor rights has been rolled back. And the most recent uh, security law that has just been passed by the People's Republic of China uh, has a tremendous threat to the work of, of the trade union movement of working people seeking uh, better conditions at work and uh, justice and democracy. So I'm going to invite uh, Lee Chok Yan to uh, talk uh, uh, to us and explain to us what's happening in Hong Kong. And as we know, there's hundreds of thousands of Chinese Canadians in Greater Toronto, many of them uh, Cantonese speakers coming from Hong Kong, many others Mandarin speakers coming from elsewhere in China. But uh, this solidarity between workers of uh, Greater Toronto and uh, Hong Kong and China is an important part of how we see our obligation to be building a better world together. Brother uh, Lee Chok Yan. Yeah, thank you, John, uh, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I think it's very important uh, at this very critical moment and a very dark moment in Hong Kong that there can be um, international solidarity and people are aware of what is happening uh, in Hong Kong with the new national security law uh, that was uh, promulgated uh, on just uh, June 30th, 11 p.m. And no one in Hong Kong know any content of a law until it was promulgated. No consultation. Everyone is in the dark about what is happening. And suddenly, you know, uh, they, they implement the law uh, starting from July 1st. And July 1st, we have a march. And uh, then the police already prepare a banner, you know, warning the people that any display of slogan or a banner uh, may constitute a, a challenge or may, may, may breach uh, uh, the national security law on secession and subversion. So you can see that they, and also they arrest 10 people uh, for in, in the demonstration for uh, uh, breaching the law. And so they have immediately, you know, uh, on July 1st, they start to implement the law. And when you look at the law itself, you know, I will give a very brief, uh, but everyone can read the law and see how horrible it is and how wild the, 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 uh, it is. 
And what they, I, my, my imagination uh, of how they draft the law is very simple. They just go through all the, all the uh, photos and videos of last year protests and then write down all the uh, actions or behavior that they do not like. And then they want to ban and in the name of the uh, national security law. So when you look at the law itself, it's quite absurd. Uh, it includes many aspects. For example, uh, secession. The international uh, standard is that any secession by force, of course, uh, uh, it will breach uh, international, uh, uh, not allow under international standard because by force. But then the law they said by force or not by force. So the mere fact that you 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 voice out some aspiration for some uh, 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 somehow. Uh, a, a dissent from the government uh, on, you know, uh, on the status of Hong Kong, then you you may be kept, caught by the law. Uh, for example, waving a flag uh, will be caught by the law because I think the Communist Party are really angry with that. And when you look at subversion, uh, it, it, it includes, uh, you know, sort of, you know, uh, damaging uh, uh, government facilities. When you look at damaging government facility, you know, of course, it's not. Uh, uh, you can, you know, charge them with Hong Kong a lot of criminal uh, offense under Hong Kong. You can do that, but then damaging uh, government facility becomes subversion. And uh, when you look at the clause of collusion with foreign power, uh, of course, they don't like sanction, so they have right now no any about you know taking sanction, calling for sanction against China. Uh, is collusion for foreign power, and, and that will be caught under the national security law. But there, there's one term inside the, uh, the, the, the law, in which is quite absurd, is that uh, sort of promoting hatred against the, uh, the government. So when I, you know, talking to you guys, you know, I don't want you to hate the government, you know, in a way, we want just democracy. But then if you said that, you know, if they feel that what I'm saying is letting people hate the government, and then it will be caught with uh, collusion. What is the meaning of hate? I do not know. So all this are happening in, in the law. And, and therefore, they, they are trying to, what they are trying to do uh, uh, is to instill fear among the people of Hong Kong uh, and, and for people of Hong Kong to exercise uh, self-censorship and then uh, try to suppress the protests uh, and all the aspiration of the people of Hong Kong for democracy by having this national security law and impose it uh, on, on the people. And um, so, uh, and also one more aspect of the law I want to talk about it before I go into the union movement is that um, the, the law also allow uh, the national security apparatus to be installed in Hong Kong, you know, headed by the Communist Party. And also they have agency coming to Hong Kong and then there are power given to the police in Hong Kong to search, to uh, confiscate computer, to intercept communication uh, without going to the due process that is required by other law in Hong Kong. And so this secret police operation is sort of above the law uh, in, in, in Hong Kong. And, and therefore, when you look at all this, adding together, it's really uh, a secret police operation with uh, a very absurd and uh, all encompassing law uh, to catch your uh, behavior and then uh, from rule of law we go to the rule, rule by fear and for the union movement you know uh, there are uh, we, there, there's a there's also of course there's a, uh, a difficulty challenge uh, uh, you know um, suppression ahead and but we have we, we are you know uh, encouraged by the fact that um, you know, the, there's a new union movement coming uh, in Hong Kong, emerging out of the protest movement. So in the past, of course, uh, the CTU had always been um, uh, mobilizing workers for democracy. And very often we start from the workplace and uh, go to the political level to uh, get everyone involved in the democracy movement in Hong Kong. But now people start with democracy movement in Hong Kong, protest movement, and then say that maybe the way out is to have a, 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 a to have a trade union. It's a power base for future 
globalization and struggle. And so we, the, the, the new movement will start from uh, the protest movement and they go down and combine in, uh, together with the um, uh, uh, with the grass uh, with the, the workplace movement, so that both in the workplace for justice, economic justice, and then uh, the uh, protest movement or the the rocker movement for uh, uh, political justice. So I, I think this this, this uh, emerging uh, uh, new union movement among the all the civil servants, the medical staff. Uh, the IT, the uh, finance sector, uh, the the hotel sector, all this are, are quite uh, uh, encouraging that they, we can see in the future uh, there may be difficulty, there may be, there may be suppression on the CTU and the, our uh, affiliate, uh, but still, you know, uh, the, the, the base is uh, being widened. And, 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 and finally, one point is about the, even... What? The, 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 oh, come on! Pardon? Then say when kids play with home, they will play with them. Can we mute? Is it okay? Yes, we're good. But we okay. just want the controller to mute the other speakers, please. Now we can't hear the speaker. Okay. okay, go ahead and, now. Yeah, now I think I, 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 I can unmute. And also, finally, one more point is when um, when you look at the, the, the uh, new uni movement and also the future of the uni movement, there are, apart from the worry about a national security law, you know, uh, instilling fear among the people, they will also try to use the present, the other law against the union. Especially, we do not have the right to strike. And, and if uh, workers in Hong Kong try to go to strike, they will, you know, uh, it is very no protection. So will, there will be a problem of dismissal. And secondly, you know, they will have a multi-pronged attack uh, on, on the different sector of the, of the society, like uh, the, working, the working people. Civil servant, they will ask you to pledge allegiance to the government. And if you show any sign of so-called disloyalty, they will try to uh, uh, put pressure on the civil servant, or maybe they will even try to penalize them by dismissal. Or the teachers, they are asking for dismissing the teachers that they think are, are spreading uh, 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 wrong information to the students. And so they are also putting pressure on, on, on the uh, teachers. So every aspect of society, no matter from the government, and on the business side, they are putting pressure on the workers not to post things on the Facebook or not to wear some uh, of a, 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 a protest movement uh, type of slogan on the T-shirt. And, and those sort of things, every aspect of life, it's not just about the national security law that catch at political activism. It will be, they will try to, you know, uh, sort of cleanse out any opposition, even on the very daily life basis. And so, what we have to do is to, on the daily life basis, uh, show a, show defiance uh, to this uh, government and try to continue the protest movement by encouraging people to fight on. So I, I think the time I know that you you guys uh, the the, con the council had a lot of other agenda, but what I finally want to say that uh, is that you know Hong Kong is in a very critical movement and uh, we 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 need support. Uh, 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 international solidarity in the union movement uh, to support Hong Kong and the workers move uh, and the workers struggle, especially when we say every sector of workers are uh, going to face difficulty and uh, suppression. Thank you. Thank you very much, brother. And uh, our, our Labour Council will definitely be sending a letter to our own government asking them to take action. We'll uh, be sending uh, messages as well to the governments in uh, China and Hong Kong. Uh, the work that you've done is so inspiring because uh, I know with the labor laws that are not strong there, you've still been able to build a very strong grassroots-based labor movement struggling for rights for all workers. So thank you, my brother, for joining with us tonight. And we'll thank do whatever you. we can to provide solidarity. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. So we're going from struggles in across the world uh, to the struggles 
in our own backyard. Um, we are going to uh, open up to our co-chairs, but first we're gonna show a video from our sister labor council in Boston uh, on systemic racism and Black Lives Matter. But we need to get sound on that. And while we're getting the sound uh, linked up, just to notice in the chat room, there was a link to the statement we're gonna be having later on today, uh, zero tolerance for racism at the workplace. And maybe uh, in a minute, that'll go up again. Um, are we able to get the video now with sound? <music> Our country is on fire. And we are fed up. Our economic and political systems are rigged to favor the super wealthy. Racism in all its forms must be abolished so that our multiracial working class can unite. The labor movement knows that we cannot win economic justice without racial justice and that black lives matter. It is time to act. We will say their names. George Floyd, Rihanna Taylor, Tommy Dabry, Sandra Bland, Eric Gardner, Tony McDade. We will take the time to grieve with our black and brown families, friends and neighbors. Continue to suffer unimaginable violence and loss. We will speak up and speak out for more resources for black communities. We will march against police brutality and against any new jails. We will show up in the streets for our homes for all, for health care for all, and good jobs for all. We will have hard conversations with each other to push for greater understanding, healing, and unity. We will use our collective power to make sure black and brown people can breathe and thrive. We will organize to tax the rich so that we can be fed and advance the public good. And we will strategize and struggle together with our community partners. And we will fulfill our duty to fight for the new world that we know is possible. We are Boston's labor movement. We are Boston's labor movement. Movement. We are Boston's labor movement. We are Boston's labor movement. And we fight for black lives. And we fight for black lives. Fight for black lives. We fight for black lives. And we fight for black lives. We fight for black lives. Well, thank you. So we're now gonna introduce the co-chairs of our equity meet, uh, Danica Izzard and Ainsworth Spence. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I, um, so as, uh, as John said, I'm Danica Izzard. I'm the co-chair of the equity committee. And uh, last month at Labor Council, we passed a, a statement, racism on the front page. Um, you can find this on uh, the, the Labor Council website on the homepage or by clicking equity. And last week, I attended the Labor Council Executive Board meeting as a guest, along with Yolanda McLean, president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, Ontario Chapter, and Nigel Bariff, the president of the Urban Alliance on Race Relations. And we were there to participate in a discussion on the work that Labor Council is doing on systemic racism. And um, we will, and sorry, uh, one sec. Um, and this work is going to be divided into, um, focused into three main areas, policing, education, and economic justice. So we have the policing statement here tonight. And there's, um, so, um, and I think John has um, alluded to where you can find it. Um, it was all sent to everybody. Um, and you can also, so everyone should have got the email where you can find it. And I believe it's also in the chat as well. Um, there's been a renewed urgency on the education issue with um, developments in Peel region. And as well, this goes back to the crisis in York region around anti-Black racism and Islamophobia. 
So we're working with all our education affiliates and we're gonna to work together to develop a comprehensive document that addresses this issue. With respect to the economy, we'll be delving into action that's grounded in the just recovery for all principles, um, which Labor Council and the CLC have endorsed and it can be found at justrecoveryforall.ca. And so at this point now, I'm just gonna turn um, things over to my equity committee co-chair, Ainsworth Spence. Thank you, Danica, and hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ainsworth Spence, SEIU Healthcare, and I'm the co-chair of the equity committee alongside Danica. Um, discrimination in all its forms threatens our country's rich social fabric, including the workplaces of union members and the communities in which we live. Dividing people because of race, religion, ancestry, or other difference that undermines human rights serves only to weaken our union and our society. This is a quote from our Charter of Inclusive Workplace and Community. So the Yes It Matters Sorry, Yes It Matters Addressing Systemic Racism campaign is a joint project of the Toronto and York Region Labor Council and Community Services. The intent is to help us explore how we think about systemic racism and discrimination, sorry, sorry, let me repeat that again. The intent is to help us explore how we think about systemic racism and discrimination, our sisters and brothers experience. Along with the equity committee, the yes, uh, Kingsley, there we go. Uh, along with the equity committee, the Yes It Matters advisory board, uh, which I serve on, has been engaged in several initiatives since its inception but even more so over the last several weeks. One of the initiatives is asking affiliates to sign on to the Charter of Inclusive Workplaces and Communities. This initiative is not new, but we are once again asking affiliates to sign on, even if you've done so in the past. We've since revamped the Charter in, in light of the uh, current climate of racial tension. Uh, we've added several bullets or rather revamped some of the bulletin points that we had and it reads as follows. Anti-black and anti-indigenous racism and all other forms of racism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism and bigotry have no place in our workplaces or communities. Discrimination and acts of hate against union members and others in our communities marginalizes individuals and groups and excludes them from participating fully in our union, workplaces and their communities. The dignity of every member is essential to a healthy and vibrant union and workplace. As a union movement, we will work with all levels of government, indigenous people, civil society and communities to develop policies, programs and initiatives to reduce and eliminate racism, hate and bigotry in all its forms. By working together, we can nurture inclusive workplaces and strengthen our shared commitment to our union's shared values of equality, respect, justice and dignity for all. In, in, in the past, we, we haven't had many support in terms of union affiliates signing on to the charter of, of uh, inclusive workplace and communities. Um, um, but today more than ever, I think it's vitally important that we all are in this together. Um, we will be breaking into groups in a few minutes to have a more intimate conversation about how we can encourage our affiliates to sign on to the Charter of Inclusive Workplace 
workplaces and communities. Um, if we support change and believe that we must transition away from the status quo, now is the time. Now is the time to take action. Statements are great. We know some of them are so beautifully written. Mm, I'm touching my heart. But let's now turn these statements into action. There are many instances of workplace discrimination and hate. One example is Michael Garan Hospital, where two nooses were found. Make no mistake, racial discrimination is alive here in Canada. It's not an American thing. Later tonight, SEIU Healthcare will support the statement denouncing racism by our sisters and brothers from Constructions Union. I encourage unions to sign on to the Charter of Right because it is a move that we must make. It is important. And I will hand it over to Gobi to bring us further into the conversation. Gobi. Thank you, uh, Ainsworth. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Hi, my name is uh, Gobi Surya Kumar and um, I'm the Vice President of QP Local 4948, the Toronto Public Library Workers Union. Today, I just want to share a presentation that myself, along with our local president, Brandon Haynes, had, showed, had presented to the employer, the Toronto Public Library Board, on June 22nd, 2020. So every so often, when there are discussion of racism or racial ten tension, the city librarian would provide a report or statements to the board, but there has never been any tangible outcome, such as an action plan or time frame, to achieve these goals. Once again, the city librarian was providing a report on tackling anti-Black anti racism, and this was an opportunity for us to show our presentation using quotes from our members and statistics and data from the TPL that racism exists within our own workforce. Once again, some of these quotes from our members can be upsetting, but these are the real facts, and these are what our members had gone through. During the presentation uh, to the board, we cited the uh, Labor Council's Yes It Matter Charter as we embraced it. The main emphasis we made was that if it was possible for various labor unions and groups to set aside our differences and work towards something positive, why is it difficult for a Toronto Public Library to do the same? Mainly, highlighting the last point on the charter where we in the labor movement are able to create an inclusive workplace and strengthen the shared commitment to our shared values of equality, respect, justice, and dignity for all which again, I'm sure it is part of the Toronto Public Library Board's court, uh, code of conduct. But once again, when you look at the codes, you'll see it's not evident in practice. Next slide. Were you able to go to the next slide? Sorry, Gobi, there seems to be a bit of okay, a glitch. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll continue. If it's could you read just one or two of the quotes while Susan's trying to make that happen? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so using some of the, oh, there you go. So using some of the data from the survey that TPL had conducted over the years, we showed their lack of commitment to make changes. There are far more, in this, in this uh, chart right here, there are far more visible minority workers in precarious, lower paid, non-supervisory position, whereas there's about 80% white folks in management position who are holding some of the well-paid jobs. Given this result from 2014 survey, our HR was supposed to come up with an action plan, but nothing ever happened. Next slide. We, we, we also uh, highlighted uh, the employer's 2018 employee uh, engagement survey that showed that 47% of employees feel that managers and directors do not have a good understanding on the issues employees face. That is about half the workforce. And also 31% believe that TPL has a culture that isn't open to feedback, suggestion or change. So that's about one third of the workforce. 
So there are a few, uh, so on the next slide, there are two quotes that I, I will be reading out. But again, uh, there are far more quotes that we uh, presented to the library board. So the first one, I applied for a supervisory position and went for an interview. Both managers were Caucasian. After looking over the written question, one of the managers asked me if I had watched to keep the time. I said no, as I had left my watch at home. She held her wrist, rotated the watch on her hand and said, so I can lend you my watch, but understand this watch has been in my family for quite a while. It has been passed down. It has a bit of gold in it. I will like it back afterwards. She placed the watch on my paper and the other manager walked me down the hall as if I hall, I felt like I was walking to a cell in Rikers Island. I kept processing her words. I sat in the room. I looked at the questions. I knew the answers. I looked over at the watch. The manager's words stung my ears repeatedly. I began to cry. I drew a big X on my paper, gathered my things and walked away. In the second quote, I've been asked my country of origin was when I was quietly eating my lunch. And when I was told them, when I told them where I was from, I was asked if I was one of those terrorists by a colleague, a white male in a supervisory position. When I approached my manager about it, she asked if he was joking. Next slide. So showing these quotes from our members and the data to the library board, the board in fact had no questions at the end of our presentation and only two uh, racialized board members uh, in the, on the library board basically thanked us for our presentation. And as, in, as, um, as uh, Spencer had mentioned that um, we, we are sick and tired of having many reports given out, but there's no action such that we provided some action plan and we felt that it was necessary to tackle the systemic racism in our own workplaces. Even though there weren't any response from the board, the senior management has started having preliminary discussion with us in tackling anti-black racism and other racism within our workplace just a week after our presentation. So we hope that we can set up some tangible goals and in a, in a limited time frame, so that we can eliminate systemic racism. Next slide. And I just want to end off with this quote from the Ontario Library Association. Diversity is an essential component of any civil society. It is more than a moral imperative. It is a global necessity. Everyone can benefit from diversity and diverse population need to be supported so they can reach their full potential for themselves and their communities. Thank you. Thanks, Kobe. And uh, Local 4948 not only endorsed the charter when it first came out and took the plan of engagement that's on the Yes It Matters uh, campaign, but they've also re-endorsed the charter again as they decided to take their work to management and demand that management use its power to uh, exercise a change in the workplace because we all know managers are the ones who have power. And if they determine that certain practices and programs are going to take place in the workplace, those things do happen. Um, and so we are asking every union to look at the Yes It Matters campaign. It's on our website at laborcouncil.ca equity and to take that back to your executive board, to take that to your stewards, to, to you know, take it to your membership and have a conversation. And we're using the charter as the conversation starter so that people don't necessarily have to become experts in, in every aspect of human rights. These, this charter reflects our values as a union movement. And that's what we're, we're trying to uh, undertake here. A couple of weeks ago, uh, people of Toronto were shocked and construction workers like myself were shocked to hear of an incident at the Michael Guerin Hospital, whereas as uh, Ainsworth said, SCIU represents uh, staff in the, in the hospital itself. Two nooses were hung in a room at uh, that construction job site to send a message to black workers on the site, a message that reminded people of the lynching of thousands of black men in the United States. Uh, the response was immediate. The, a number of black workers stood up for their own rights. Uh, the complaints went immediately to the hospital, to the general contractor, Elliston. Uh, messages went back to every union uh, about this horrific incident. And uh, there has been a call for a criminal investigation. The police have been involved. 
uh, the, the general contractor, Alistan, is actually creating its own investigation, and all the unions concerned are outraged and uh, committing to take action against anti-Black racism in construction. We have in our, in our statement, we've, we've reflected a number of open letters that have been published just in these last few days. And we also quote Alistan. You know, Alistan is one of the largest general contractors in this country. Uh, I've, I've known the Elliston leadership for many years. They're tough negotiators. I've been on the other side of a table with them, but I have to say that Jeff Smith in calling for immediate criminal uh, uh, investigation, prosecution, and for the perpetrators to be run out of the construction industry is the kind of response that we need to have uh, universally to anybody who's carrying out this kind of hate. Um, we've got letters from, uh, from the plumbers and pipe fitters one of their members was a victim of this crime and has been completely supported by his union and his own employer. And we've got other letters that you can see in the links of the zero tolerance of racism at work. But I'm gonna invite uh, a number of speakers from the construction unions to, to speak, starting with Steve Martin, uh, who's the business manager of the IBEW, uh, Local 353. And uh, then uh, any other person from the trades who wants to speak, please, Raise your hand in the in the uh, in the participant function, and uh, and then I'll recognize you. So, Steve Martin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for obviously having this discussion today. Uh, it is a very difficult discussion, uh, given the fact that uh, the incidents that happened at Michael Guerin Hospital at 81 Bay Street and over at Sumac Street as well. Uh, it is absolutely. Um, uncalled for, unwanted, unwarranted, and uh, it just can't happen. It just can't happen. Uh, the, the founding principles of every single union that is out here, uh, and, and it, bar none, uh, is to strive for a betterment of all, not a betterment of some, not a betterment of a few, but of every single member. Uh, even though it's, it's a local 46 member, uh, it, it, that is absolutely irrelevant. Uh, having Alistair and the rest of the construction trades that are on, on the job asking for the hate crimes unit to come in and, and investigate uh, was only the first step. Uh, the second step is for all of us to get our heads around the idea of how do we prevent it going forward and where do we go from here. Uh, I, I'm very happy to say that our, our, our executive board today, uh, we met, uh, we have now uh, signed on to the Charter of Inclusive Workplaces. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy that that happened. Uh, and, and we move forward from here. Uh, it, it's just absolutely something that cannot happen uh, in the society that we have. Uh, if, if people don't realize it or, or they're, they're, they're deniers of it, we need to educate, right? If, if, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Right, we, we do whatever we have to, to to ensure that the workplaces that we have, the, the, the society that we live in is free of all barriers. Right? It should not be because of any sort of white privilege or, or, or whatnot uh, thoughts that are out there uh, that people are moved forward or people are moved in different direction. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it can't be. That's not what we were founded on and it's not anything that, that our local believes in, uh, our, our executive uh, in particular, uh, believe it or not, the, the conversation around this uh, at the, with our executive is very short and sweet. It's uh, you know, something that's a long time coming. It should have happened. Uh, it is happening now. Uh, you know, let's get in behind it and let's, let's get moving forward. So uh, with that, you know, I'll leave it to your other speakers to, to carry on from there. Thanks. We're going to have to mute uh, some other speakers. Uh, we have other people who got background noise. Uh, thanks, Steve. I'm going to recognize Sean Blake from the Carpenters and I think Chris Campbell. Yes, yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm just waiting for an okay. opening. Okay, why don't we start with Chris Campbell and then Sean Blake. So, hi everyone, I'm Chris Campbell. I'm a representative of the Carpenters Union, uh, Local 27. Um, 
also um, been assigned uh, community benefits, diversity inclusion um, task of um, um, assisting members and um, um, reaching out into the various communities uh, across Toronto. Okay, so I've been a member for 30 years. I've been a representative for about 17 years, right? Um, myself, I, I wanna talk about myself a little bit and, and what I went through um, when we saw the um, George Floyd um, incident, murder on the television. I was sitting at home with my kids. I turned on the TV. Um, I was, you know, on the sofa and my kid looked at me and said, dad, what's happening? And um, I was shocked, I was um, angry, I was upset. And, um, you know, I couldn't find words to explain what was happening. I said, I've never seen that happen. Um, so, so such a cruel act, you know, on, on the news uh, for, for many years, right? So what, what happened is um, I went to my office and I, and I said to my, my uh, coordinator, Paul Daly, Paul, I need that flag. I, I have to go and march in that Black Lives Matter um, peaceful march protest. I, I went over again. I, I saw Tony Anutzi, our provincial representative. And I say, Tony, I, I have to go out there and represent my family, my members, um, you know, members from my community. It's, it's my duty. He says, Chris, take that flag and go down there and march, you know, be safe, but go down there and march and represent your family, represent the union, represent the community. Because, um, and then he went into this little story and he's telling me, Chris, it's your duty to do it because when I came here as a, as a young Italian man, we went through a lot of struggles similar to what you went through. And um, so I, I, I have to encourage you and let you know, Chris, you know, get your members and go down there and participate. So we went down there and we marched and myself was there, Sean Blake was there, Clifton Donegal, um, um, Robert Mitchell and a few other people, MJ, a few folks from the 20, from local 27 and their family and their kids and their spouses. So we marched and, and we participate. We also had um, CB2U, a group from cb 2 CBTU there, I, I felt proud. I, 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 I sent pictures back to my office and, and I, I think they proudly um, put up a video of us, um, you know, marching down the middle of, of, of what else it was, um, University Avenue and, and, and Dunda Street and, and it felt good, it felt good. So I must commend my, my, my leaders, my leaders who didn't, who could easily say, Chris, go in a car, they could easily say, look, enough of you, right? But, you know, they told me, yes, go ahead, you know, go and do it. A couple of days later, CBC called me. CBC called me and they go, um, what's happening, Chris? I want to have a little interview. I want you to tell me about, you know, the news is on the site. And is this a, is this a, a new thing? Is this um, because of George Floyd? George Floyd, is this, um, is this something that's never happened before? I says, no, 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 no. I've experienced it, and I'm sure there's a lot of members out there that have experienced it. Because I went, I went to, the, to to a little bit of background, telling them about the first time I was I started teaching at the um, at an institution in Toronto, and um, I came in the class, and there was a news on the on the, on the board, and the class it, the class, you know, some members in the class even thought it was funny. But because I'm, I'm aware of, of how things usually play out, and that's my experience, I would um, get rid of it, but uh, take a few pictures and, and just keep it moving because that's what normally happens. And so I told the story and they wrote, it, they wrote it down. And after I started getting so many calls, so many texts, so many emails, so, so, so many people start explaining to me, okay, yes, it happened to you. Did you know it happened to me on this subway? Did you know it happened to me on this building? Did you know it happened to me? And I go, oh my gosh, this is nothing new. So right away I had to tell my, my, the president of my organization and other fellows, I experienced it. It happened on three sites in Toronto, but it's been happening during my time, and I'm sure that it has happened before in, in, with the folks that came before me, right? 
I'm not going to sit here and tell you that um, my union was always inclusive, right? That's not true. My union, um, before my time, I have members, retired members who came up to me and they speak open. They say, they explain to me in the, the 60s and 70s, they were refused membership. Yes, it happened. It's the reality. It's the reality of Toronto. They used to refuse black members from the Carpenters Union. Yes. However, today, the Carpenters Union openly condemn racist behavior, right? That's, things has changed. Things has evolved. I think it's important before we go forward, acknowledge how things were before, right? Things has changed and, and, and now we have different leadership, we have different perspective, people have retired and move on. And so we're going in a different direction. Um, my executive recently passed a motion um, in support or, or to adapt an anti-black racism policy, right? And my, my president, my, my coordinator, Paul Daly, my president, Mike York, um, with, us, with some support from um, John Cartwright and many others um, in my in my executive, we support it. We we made some change to make it easier to to to, to comprehend. But we so we put it forward and it was adapted. That was one of the pro proudest moments in in my 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 life as a, a union representative to see my carpenters union openly adapt an anti-black racism policy. I think I recently posted on Canada Day tell them, telling everyone mm -hmm. how proud I am to be a, 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 a citizen, a resident of Toronto, how, how good it made me feel that, okay, not just me, I'm, 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 I'm living the moment, but generations that comes after me will, will look back and say, yes, this is one of our major turning point in the history of my Carpenters Union. Um, my Carpenters Union, um, like I said, things have changed. So I'm gonna ask you to wrap up shortly. Okay, my Carpenters Union, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna express that the union, Carpenters Union, um, uh, they are, are, are um, very deeply involved in the community right now. Um, for over the past couple of years, you know, with, with the support of my executive and the membership, we're, we're deeply engaged and we've, um, we've, we've um, been participating and, and um, supporting organization, black organization like the black, um, the, the, the CBTU, Coalition of Black Trade Unions, the Black uh, Business and Professional Association, Black History Society in Toronto, um, the Jamaica Canadian Association, the Black Chamber of Commerce. And um, we also, we also um, communicate, embrace, um, um, put ads in the um, local Black medias of Toronto, sharing, promoting and, 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 and telling everyone in Toronto about the good things, the changes um, that the union is making out there for the black community, many other community, but today we're talking about the black community, hence the, 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 the new scenario that, we've, um, that um, we've experienced out there. I won't go much further because I know there are other speakers. I do speakers. have to cut you off now because we got other speakers. We okay, please time. go ahead. Okay, uh, Sean Blake followed by uh, Joe Papananich. Good evening, everyone. And we we do ask people to keep to about three minutes now, if that's all right. Carpenters Union. Um, I would like to start off by saying that um, every worker in Ontario has the right to go to work and feel safe. Where we're at right now, the unions have the opportunity to shape society as we have endeavored to do. So we're at a crossroads right now where we can either go left or right. We can go left or we can go right. We can go right the right way or we can stay the same. And so um, I, I'm glad to see that government is, is on board, excuse me, 
and, uh, and the, the companies in construction. But this goes further. This racism starts when every child is in, <coughs> excuse me, is in elementary school, okay? The education system is geared towards starting Black History Month with every black person in bondage. So if you're a little kindergarten kid, you hear that. You don't know what it means, but you hear it in grade one, two, right on up through. And the other side of the class, they get to hear that, you know what? You people were conquerors. So now we go out into society and the black person already feels inferior. And then we pad our leadership in companies with only one race. And then we do everything else to try to minimize blacks. So until we stop doing this and until we fix our education system, this is just that, that, that wheel that we're on. And I know we're trying to make a dent, but everybody in society has to come to the table. And the unions, as soon as the person is identified or the people, the perpetrators are identified as having done this, the only way that message gets sent is yes, they are charged by the police with a hate crime. And second, their, their financial situation has to it be impacted. So that gets out into the industry amongst all the workers and they start to say, well, maybe I gotta start changing my view. I'll leave it there, but that conversation needs to be had. We need to continue to have those tough conversations and everybody has to want to be at the table, everyone. You cannot come up with an excuse as to why you're not gonna be there. We have to, and now that we're there, we must keep that momentum going. So I applaud the, uh, the, the companies that have stepped forward to um, take a look at their own membership or their own employees. But I also applaud the unions too, because they, they, they are at the point where they realize that, you know what, that person or those people must not continue to infect the other members of this union or each union. So applaud everyone at the table. And now we need to see action as was said last night. Okay, we need to see action. And we will help, we will be at the table um, with those who, who, who control construction, those who control society. We will be there to help mold and shape so that everybody, it doesn't matter, creed, sex, orientation, doesn't matter. Everybody gets to realize their productive level they get to realize their reason for being here. And I think that government will benefit from that. <clears throat> Calmer society, more people at work, more people working, that equals tax dollars in my mind. Economically, what this has done to the construction site is the productivity is, 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 has spiraled out of control because members are talking to one another. No one's working. And when we go to speak on construction sites, how much money is standing there? How much money is standing there? Because someone is a low key racist amongst our membership. So we have to do a better job too, how we're bringing people in to make sure that they understand the reason that they're here, that we have a system that works and it's equality for all. And until that, is, until that message is sent, we will continue to go in circles. So yeah, I like, I like the, where we're headed, but I also want to see action too. I want to see the rubber hit the road. And I know that my union, as Chris did say, has adopted um, the charter, right? So I applied our unions and I asked the other unions to step up and do the same and then start to look around, look amongst your rank and file members for those folks that don't need to be there. Thank you, Sean. And, and for everybody that's watching, if you, if you open up this statement, you'll see there are uh, six recommendations that are very explicit about changing the dynamics. The next up, I have Joe Papadonitz from Local 30 and then Mamadou Ba from Local 506, followed by Carolyn Egan. Thanks, uh, can everyone hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, thanks. Um, first of all, I, I just wanna say that uh, we at Local 30 stand in solidarity with labor and uh, we just put out a statement um, this afternoon. I'm gonna put it on the chat 
Uh, uh, Blair's so, just on that. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. Um, I don't. Again, I don't. I'm. I kind of speechless about the whole thing. We got a lot of work to do, and I know that um, we're going to be reaching out to uh, definitely you, John, and and Labor Council, and uh, the other delegates, and everyone. Um, our membership is asking that we. Uh, you know, immediately as as we're able to get uh, guest speakers into our union meetings, we want to we want they want to see them there and and talk about this. And this is the time to make that change. Uh, like the previous speakers have said, this is the time to do it. And and we really need to make that difference right now. And unions need to lead. So, thanks right. for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, uh, Brother Mamadou Ba from Labor's Five Hundred Six. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, John Contrait, and uh, thank you for the opportunity, and thank you for everybody. Uh, my name is Mamadou Ba, business representative from Lionel Local 506, and uh, uh, executive board member of uh, Lionel African American Caucus and member of the TCPN. And uh, we all here together to fight with the good cause. Uh, since this, all these things is happening, and uh, into our backyard, into our country, into our neighboring country, and then uh, everybody get panic, and everybody uh, start to go in left and right, and and then uh, people are very uh, uh, going going crazy right now because what we are hoping in this country and and our neighboring country is people to live side by side, uh, with peaceful manner, happiness, and working together. That's the main thing. That's that's the life we all everybody are expecting to have. When uh, George Floyd was uh, brutally killed, and uh, we all see that. And then uh, uh, myself, I was shocked because originally I come from West Africa. I came in 1987. The, the reason I come to Canada uh, as young child, because I believe I, I, here is a better place to live to my own country in West Africa. That's the only reason I left over I come here. But when I come here and the main reason, after I finished my study, the main reason I joined the union, because I believe the union is the way to go, the union protect the workers, the union represent the workers, and the government support the union. So that's the way to come here and work in peace and have a better life to support our family. But recent, the recent years, when I start seeing things going a little bit, a little bit, police brutality, uh, mostly uh, uh, toward black people, and then uh, uh, mass car car incarceration to the black people. And then I start, I start telling myself what's going on here? Because my hope was, I mean, the better country in the world, democracy, lovely people. And then I start shaking my head, but as time goes on, it's a lot of obstacle coming. Time going also is a lot of obstacle coming. So I'm wondering what's going on. So what I see here right now with the union, and the Labour Council and the government, and then I would like to all of us to stay together to fight for this, for the better life for all of us. I sent a nice letter to our executive board member in the United States, the, uh, the Latin African American Caucus. I would like to read you that letter of brief. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, myself, Mamadou, and Anthony Tony Stop from Local Wanity, we are the board member of the Latin African American Caucus. So on behalf of Mamadou Ba, and Tony Stubb and the ranking five, we, we extend our sincere condolences to George Floyd family, as well as many other who has been affected by police brutality in America and all over the world. The black race has been victimized and treated unfairly for more than 400 years. We have been carrying the weight of systematic discrimination on our soldiers for a long time and cannot longer accept it. Uh, George Floyd violence uh, that was a breaking point. Now it is a time to receive the respect and, and, deserve, and, and deserve the human as well as uh, finally receive the recognition of our many contributions, whether it be the economic or hard work we put out daily. We can longer tolerate racial discrimination 
and the killing of our people. We are all human. At the end of the day, all races should be put to shame. And, and we deserve better. No one deserves to be treated like that. We all bleed the same way, our, 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 our pain, our cry, and our need to be seen and heard, uh, reasoning. So throughout the entire world. So that's the letter I sent to the uh, 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 Lion African American Caucus in the United States. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I, and then I would like to see the government supporting us on all aspects to make sure we have a better life in here in Canada. And then what all, everybody hoping for a better life and safe to go back home safe. Thank you. Thanks, Mamadou. Uh, I recognize Carolyn Egan, followed by Ainsworth Spence as the last speaker. Carolyn? Thanks very much. Carolyn Egan, United Steelworkers. Uh, I strongly uh, support the zero tolerance for rape and, uh, and very much uh, take my hat off to the building trades uh, unions that have come out and, uh, and dealt with the racism that was being seen on, on the building sites. I want to talk about something that affected my union. We have a, a, a black leader on the executive of Local 1998. He's a full-time health and safety officer. Carolyn, you may have he to turn white, off your video. He's not black. He's a black activist. We're walking through D'Antonio Park in the scene. Okay. They had a new puppy, 10 weeks old. Two dogs came by, two white men, a father and son, attacked the dog. She asked them to put them on the leash. They started yelling at her. Mark said, back off, please, what's going on here? They called him the N-word. They uh, the, the young guy threatened to shoot him. And uh, a, young, a woman who was with them then attacked well, our, uh, the, the, the wife of our member, brought her to the ground. And the young guy, the son of the older one, and kicked her in the head. Her kick in the head. She lost consciousness. Again, the N-word, again, threatened to shoot, all of this. He called uh, 911, both for the uh, paramedics plus for the police, uh, because they didn't know what was happening next there. Police arrived, paramedics arrived. She uh, was taken to the hospital. Uh, she regained consciousness, but it was a very severe, con severe concussion. And uh, he asked the charges, assault charges be laid, and uh, the police refused to do it. They said it was a he said, she said. Even with the words being said, the, uh, the racist diatribe that was spoken, the attack that had happened, and uh, they asked him to go back to his house, uh, put the pup away, and uh, give them a statement. He went back to the house. He finds that these people actually live in the same apartment building. And uh, days have passed now. Still absolutely no charges have been laid. It's reprehensible. And when we see the polarization in the United States, we're seeing the polarization, as Sean said, Things can go left or right. We're moving two ways about it in a progressive way forward, trying to build unity against racism in our workplaces and our community. But we're also seeing right right wing forces uh, growing as well. So the Toronto Area Council, we have called along with the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists and an East End group, a Toronto East Anti-Hate Mobilization, a demonstration at 55 Division on uh, Monday at 12 noon, uh, calling for charges to be laid, calling for a stop to this hate and st calling for a stop to the anti-black racism that we're seeing all around us. That's at 55 Division. Mark uh, could not be here tonight. He's not a delegate, but he, uh, he strongly uh, requested that the United Steelworkers bring this forward and ask anyone who is able to join us, uh, be there please at 12 noon on Monday. Because if we don't put a stop to this right away, it is going to grow and grow not only in our workplaces, but certainly in our broader community. And this is something I think where the unity, the labor movement, the multiracial movement has to come to the fore and certainly support our black brother. Thank you very much for the time. Thanks, Carolyn. And we'll put that up in the chat that it's uh, 55 division is Dundas and Coxwell at, uh, and I think you said noon on, on Monday. Ainsworth uh, is the final Monday. speaker. Ainsworth, final speaker. Oh yeah. Um, so. In support of our sisters and brothers from the construction union, SEIU Healthcare Canada condemns all forms of racism. SEIU, at SEIU, we will, sorry, we will not tolerate these disgusting and hateful actions, nor will we permit violence or harassment that creates an intimidating, hostile, 
or offensive environment. Frontline healthcare professional at Michael Garin Hospital are working tirelessly to protect the public during a pandemic and should not experience any added fear or stress as they enter their workplace. We are in full support of our union sisters and brothers from UA Local 46, IBW Local 353, Carpenters and Leuna in denouncing hate and anti-Black racism. As one of the most diverse unions in Canada, we remain forever committed in our efforts to ensure inclusiveness, diversity and racial justice through many initiatives and actions, including our social justice capacity building program. For us to move forward, we must continue to stand in solidarity and call for immediate changes in our communities. Together, we can build a more equitable province, country, and world. John? Thanks, Andrew. So we're now going to the, the vote on the, on the statement. And I just want people to, to take a look uh, when you get the link. And so there's six recommendations. One, we condemn the hate crimes perpetrated on job sites and demand full criminal prosecution of those responsible. Two, we work with construction affiliates to help challenge systemic racism, including anti-Black racism, and take measures to ensure that all workplaces are free from any form of harassment or discrimination. We urge every union member to step up, speak out, and report any instances of racist behavior. Three, we demand that every construction contractor undertake measures needed to ensure that extensive human rights and equity training is mandatory for all employees and supervisors and that anti-racist practices become embedded in the working culture of every contractor. Four, we su strengthen support for the work of the Toronto Community Benefits Network and extend community benefits agreements to require increased hiring of racialized workers on all publicly funded construction projects. Five, we work with construction affiliates to outreach to diverse communities to recruit members from racialized and equity-seeking communities. And six, we continue to urge all affiliates to endorse the Charter of Inclusive Workplaces and Communities and undertake the crucial work of membership engagement that is outlined in the Yes It Matters campaign material. So we're going to take that vote now, and then we're going to be going into discussion rooms about how in your union you can take the plan of engagement from the Yes It Matters campaign and actually start moving it forward. So can we have the vote poll up, please? Now, while we're doing that, uh, we're gonna break you into discussion rooms. We've heard people sometimes say, well, what's the point of just pat, you know, endorsing a piece of paper? It's just a piece of paper. Deep work, challenging systemic racism, just like the deep work challenging the, the sexism was a, uh, that was a feature of our own union movement for many years, uh, requires intentionality. And the plan of engagement that we have in the Yes It Matters campaign, and there's the, you know, the picture of the Yes It Matters is a young black father with his daughter telling us that what's at stake here is people's lives and their families and the communities they live in. So we're gonna ask you to go into your chat rooms and talk about how you and your union can lead uh, the work that's outlined in Yes, It Matters, starting with endorsing the charter, but going much, much deeper in every union and then going to the employer and demanding their engagement as well. So we're gonna set you up now into uh, the chat rooms and please uh, accept whatever chat room you're being invited into.
Can they? Are you muted? No.
Okay, people are coming back. Welcome, I hope that you found that uh, useful conversation. And of course, the key thing that we ask people to do is to take a look at the actual plan of engagement because uh, that's the hard work and that lays it out. And I know just in my group, you know, there was a question, well, how will have somebody have the courage to start this conversation? And that's why we put down this list. So you can simply say, there's the checklist. There's the things we wanna follow as a union. We want our staff to undertake. We want our executive board to undertake. We want the outreach to our stewards. Uh, you know, that's what it's gonna require. So, uh, if people can put in their chat, and maybe I'll ask Susan to just explain what we're hoping you can put in the chat room. Susan, if, uh, if you can. Yep. I know there's not enough time, but that's, uh, we've still got quite a bit more to talk about it. Uh, so, Susan? Yeah, I'm just gonna put in there, uh, what we wanna hear from people is best practices that people can think of or inspiring ideas that they learned about, um, about how to go back into their union, ideas for identifying who they, the right leaders are to champion this and take it forward. Uh, and we're also gonna ask those who led the discussion in the group through an email to share ideas with us and with labor community services about how we can best push this forward. So we hope that you'll take the ideas that you heard back and work on them and share them in the chat function as well. Great, thanks. So the next item uh, is the statement on community safety and racism and policing. And this, as, as uh, Danica explained at the start, you know, last month we had an overall statement around how we're gonna step up and challenge systemic racism. And we're moving that into three areas of focus. The first one is policing, uh, the next one will be on education, and the one after that is on economic justice. The, obviously, the the uh, you know the anger in the community about the promises of change, the promises of reform within the police system, have have uh, you know just been boiling over. And we saw a debate at City Hall last week uh, where there was a modest proposal to move some of the money that goes to police over to other. Um, to other areas of work, and that was defeated uh, by the majority of council. A number of other pieces were passed by council, and some of them, in fact, uh, mirror the points that we have brought forward in this statement under recommendations in public governance. The, um, this has already gone to city council to be on record, and next week, the Toronto Police Services Board has a public consultation because when they tried to put up a piece of window dressing two weeks ago uh, in order to pretend they're making changes, they were flooded with anger and demands for adequate consultation. So uh, the Labor Council, myself, our community, our equity committee co-chairs will be uh, taking this to the Toronto Police Services Board on the record as well uh, next week. So um, it contains a series of recommendations about explicitly uh, redesigning the policing model, redirecting financial resources, demilitarizing police culture, and ensuring the law is equally applied to everybody based on human rights. Um, Mohammed Hashim has been very involved, as uh, you know, in um, the Muslim community dealing with violence from the mosque shooting uh, through to other events. And sadly, in Peel region, not that many days ago with the tragic killing of Brother Chowdhury. So I'm going to open up the statement for discussion. And I'm going to start with uh, Mohammed. And if you want to uh, be on the speakers list, please raise your hand. You go to the participants um, place and raise the hand there. OK, Mohammed. Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm gonna give a little bit of rundown of what happened. So almost two weeks ago, uh, my Imam Ibrahim Hendi called me because one of his congregants uh, had a family member who uh, was shot and killed by the police. It turned out it was a 62 year old man who was a father of four named Ijaz Chaudhry. And you know he calls me and he's like, I'm gonna go down there. Can you come with me? So the next morning we showed up at their house to kind of support. Uh, the family, um, his 11-year-old daughter called the non-emergency line um, 
and they sent in paramedics. The paramedics came into the house uh, and he was acting violently. So they tried to calm him down. And this has happened many times before where they've calmed him down. Uh, family members have intervened, the paramedics have intervened. They calm him down and then they give him his medication. And then he, uh, it, while he's having a psychotic, uh, sorry, um, a schizophrenic episode, he's, uh, you know, he wants to get his medication. He's typically okay. Um, but now we have an 11 year old girl who believes that her, the call that she made to like to get help has now ended with her father's death. So the family is in um, a, a significant amount of stress and, 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 and difficulty. You know, as a community, we came, I, you know, we came together, I put together a team. Um, we sorted out their funeral services, their burial, their, um, I mean, it, we started a GoFundMe that raised about 125,000 bucks. We set them up with lawyers. We took over all their press uh, and media relations work. And, uh, you know, as a, as a community, we kind of came together to just support them. And, you know, so on, on I, but we knew that the work that we were doing was not in a vacuum. You know, the Toronto City Council has also, you know, been debating what to do. There was a motion to defund the police. The police services board is looking at, you know, how do they actually respond to this moment in a real way? So at first, you know, when we, when we, when I got together with the family, we, they, we organized a press conference that asked for a public inquiry and not just for this death, but for all the deaths that have happened at the hands of police, that, because we need, we need more concrete uh, understandings, but also uh, we needed, we needed answers of why this happened. And then the, the very day, like the very next day, I could hear in the public narrative how the conversation was changing. Uh, and this happens every single time a black man gets killed. Uh, police say there was a black man that was killed. And the next day there's information being put out that, oh, this person may have been known to the police or it was known to get uh, a, a part of a gang or it's could be gang affiliated or it's in Regent Park or these types of pieces of information come out that uh, reduce the level of sympathy that society has for the victims of, of, of who have been murdered and allow society to feel like they deserve to die. So we started seeing that same similar uh, narratives coming out in this case. So the day after we held a, another press conference and we said, you know, fire the cop. Uh, and that, that changed the conversation away from allowing there to be any rationale for why the police would shoot an, uh, you know, a 62 year old man and not just go on with shields and just knock him over. Like the man could barely hold a cup of tea for five minutes because he was so frail, and and this is the man they had to shoot in order to you know succumb uh, to overcome. Um, and you know the point is like you know we we put a lot of statements out there, but we realized that you know like we needed to like this is a public fight that's happening right now. The conversations in the public, and this uh, and like unfortunately this this happened. Uh, but, a lot, but it did happen in this moment. So we used every opportunity to link it with, you know, Regis uh, kaczynski Payette, with Deandra Campbell, uh, and with all the others who have been killed or injured, uh, Chantel Krupka, uh, and all the indigenous people who have been killed. And we held a rally uh, on, at the police, Peel Police headquarters on Saturday, on Saturday. And, you know, we had all of them coming together to talk about what the commonality of this fight will look like. And because of such, you know, I firmly believe that power has now uh, changed. Like even the, the Canadian Mental Health Association came out and said police should not be involved in mental health responses. Um, and these conversations are all in addition to uh, the incredible work that BLM and others are doing in order to elevate the conversation. And, you know, as labor, um, I mean, we need to do a lot of work internally for sure, but this was definitely a way where we have been able to contribute to the, to the national discourse and the international discourse and be able to shift the conversation forward. So I'll leave it at that. And, uh, but, the, but the recommendations that we have um, that, go, uh, that are going to the police services board have a number of these uh, aspects around mental health and who services, who doesn't, around accountability, around you know, who actually controls the budget and who should have control of the budget how you know policing it as the oversight uh we've all lost faith in the siu and how that needs to be reformed 
And it's built upon, you know, a, two decades of really good work in collaboration with the Urban Alliance of Race Relations and other organizations. But the but this has been something that, you know, the Labor Council needs to be uh, like upfront and, for, and forward on to make sure that our voices are heard as part of this conversation. Thanks, Mohan. Um, we're gonna ask speakers to try and uh, keep to three minutes. We have a number of speakers and we actually have quite a bit of, of, of uh, other business. I uh, recognize David Kidd followed by Helen Kennedy. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. And I really appreciate the executive board statement. And there's been a few recommendations over the years concerning these matters. And what I mainly just want to say is what I commonly say on these things. It is time to democratize the police. That's the term I use. The problem I have, what happens almost every day is that the police treat citizens differently when they have interactions with them. We hear of the tragedies, the deaths, but we're talking about the basic interactions, stopping a, a person driving a vehicle, stopping a youth on the street. They treat citizens differently. And then if they are accused or if there's an allegation that they have broken the law, they're also treated differently in that regard as well. Uh, this recent case with um, uh, Del Fonte Miller happened in December 2016. It took four, five months before the SIU was informed. They weren't informed by the police department that laid the arrests against Del Fonte Miller and the two brothers. The information only came to the SIU because of the lawyer of the victim. These kind of things we have to stop. Now, what I'm saying in my, I probably only have about 40 seconds left, John, I appreciate it's a long agenda. It is time that we talk to our union members on this issue as well. I've spoken to white members of my union many times who had a sense that of course the police are just doing their job. But of course, then I would tell them the experiences that I've been heard all my life from black members, from Muslim members, from gay and lesbian members, and even from working class members. If their car is just not up to snuff, they get treated in a different way than a BMW or a Mercedes. Anyways, I just think that we need to have this conversation. I think the Labor Council directive is a good start but the only way change is gonna happen. There has been now at least 10 different recommendations that are excellent from different inquiries. We need to put in a planned action to democratize the police. Thank you. Thank you, David. We've got Helen, Sean, Laura, and Judith. So again, just asking people to stay to three minutes. Helen? Yeah, thanks, John. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, This I, I support the recommendations. Um, but I just wanted to, to highlight that these recommendations are for the city of Toronto. Um, I would really like to see what is the Labour Council's position on, you know, these are the positions, but does Labour Council support Black Lives Matter? Is Labour Council going to mobilize the membership, their membership to actually go out and support the rallies um, that are, are happening? Uh, because I think unless we have the feet on the ground, our, our feet on the ground, we're not going to be able to get these recommendations passed by city council or the provincial government or anywhere, because we need to have that mass presence in the streets. Um, uh, for example, I mean, the recommend, second recommendation to continue to investigate and remove systemic racism in all practices and culture of policing is fine, but policing itself is a is an, um, a product of the systemic racism society. So we really need to have a priority plan too. The first one around reallocating the money uh, that goes to policing and to invest that in community and social supports is primary um, and the rest come afterwards. Uh, I worked in the Lawrence Heights community for 32 years. Um, lots of experience with racism within the police department. And uh, the, you'll, you can ask any kid in, in Lawrence Heights or adult now that the worst cops were the black cops. They were, because they were a product of the system. Now, I know that that is changing now, but we have, we can't just continue to recruit uh, police officers into a system that is, systemic, is systemically racist. So we really need to have priorities in terms of what we're doing and we need to make a, a, a statement on whether we support that, that we do support Black Lives Matter and we, we, um, we want our members to be going out and supporting these campaigns uh, because, you know, they, it's not, 
it's not going to happen that there's no more black people going to be killed by the police. It's going to happen again and again until these the major recommendation here in the reallocation of the budget and the uh, dismantling of the current systemically racist police force are, are done. That's it. Thanks. Um, next, I have Sean uh, Blake, followed by Laura Thompson and Judith. Sean? Yes, John. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, where we're at with society is that um, like society has been sold a bad bill of goods. OK, um, those uh, John, you and I had this conversation just the other day, but uh, the, the folks that control and narrate what we see, they continue to sell black people as inadequate. Um, you know, they can't put two good sentences together, uh, that they are aggressive, they're militant. And so what ends up happening when a black person gets shot is all they do is enter a shadow of doubt into the whole situation. And society walks away saying, well, well, maybe, maybe they're right, you know? And then the parents of those black men that are killed say, well, holy crap, I know my kid. He's a good kid, right? Um, and, and folks like the rest of us say, well, holy shit. Like they, they keep pegging black people and they keep changing the narrative. All black people can't be bad, like, holy shit. Excuse my language, I'm not so swear, I apologize for that. Um, so until we remove, and that's what's happened now, with our technology in the citizens' hands, they get to see, because they videotape, and they say, you know what, that young black man, he was, he was actually fleeing. You know, he wasn't being aggressive to the cop. Right, so that lens of distortion has been removed, and now society starts to see what they have fallen into. Right, they took the bait. And that's why people walk down the street and look at black people out of the corner of their eye, right? As if they're up to no good. And the police keep on enforcing that when you see two black people standing together, there's a problem. So you gotta go over there. I have, went, I have experienced that. I've been, I've been stopped four times and told that there's a Sean Blake that's wanted. Two occasions they said he was white. I said, well, that's not me, you know? And they say, you don't believe me? You want to come back to the car? Or is this your real name? And I said, well, that's what my mom called me. Sean Blake says right down my license. Well, you know, there's a Blake that's one and he lives in the States. And I said, well, again, that's not me. Why are you pulling me over? Can you come to my job site and tell my supervisor that you pulled me over and that's why I'm going to be five minutes late? No, I've got a call to go to. So when you see this happening over and over again, you say there is an issue. There is a problem. So these folks get into the police force, but they've been trained by society as well too, to look at black people differently. And so that's why when it is, they're driving down the road and you're going east, west, and you're passing each other, that police officer out of the corner of his eye is looking at you. Can I ask you to wrap up, Sean? Okay, and wrapping up, um, we, we need to continue to push. I love what we're doing, but we all have to act together to get this thing eradicated. Thanks. Uh, Laura Thompson, followed by Judith. Laura, you got to unmute. Yeah. Uh, hi, Laura Thompson, OPSU Local 503. Um, so I want to thank everyone who worked on this. I have so much respect for what's being proposed. At the same time, too, I do feel that maybe we could have gone farther in the sense that we're having a conversation about defunding the police to do we need police at all, really, ultimately the grand scheme of things, given the systematic racism and problems that exist within policing and police unions, let's be honest. Um, I think it would have been nice to see a commitment as to what we're looking for in defunding or a, a firm commitment to demilitarization or working towards things we could actually achieve, like, um, uh, for example, removing um, school resource officers or transit um, enforcement officers on public transit. Um, so I, I, I'm glad to see this come forward. I, I hope I, I certainly will be voting for it, and I hope others will as well. But I also think that in this moment we can we can push farther, we can do better, and we can have a, a, a we're, we're at a point where we can have conversations about public safety that reflects the, the entire public versus the public safety that currently exists with policing as we know it now. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, Judith, last speaker. Hi. Um, I speak in favor, but I agree that we need to be maybe a little more um, clear with respect to the support for Black Lives Matter. 
I watched the entire uh, city council debate. I'm part of Progress Toronto. And if anybody's interested and you want to understand the stuff that goes on in the back rooms of City Hall, they did a watch party. And I watched the second day. So in in reference to what Laura said about uh, removing the enforcement officers off the TTC, Gord Perks brought that forward. He asked for the TTC a CEO to look at options to remove those officers because they are dressed in combat, basically, uh, carrying batons and pepper spray. And all Gord Perks asked for was, similarly that the mayor had asked for about a report, he wanted a report to provide options to remove. And I can tell you that the vote, I believe it, it lost, but it's like an 816. Anything that affects anybody's white fragility on that damn council gets voted down. 816, 717, there's the same councillors. Uh, and I encourage anyone to watch that because we need to get ready for the next election and those jokers just need to go. Uh, there's no place for white fragility on the council and um, they need to go. There, there is... There's no understanding that defunding the police means of putting money and resources into those areas within the city that are suffering with education outcomes, with health outcomes, with the effects of COVID, poverty, housing, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, never mind, my soon to be son in law gets stopped quite regularly. He's Filipino, my daughter's white. He gets stopped and questioned you know why is he why is she with him so it happens but it's happened for 400 years and every time that uh, we stand up for black lives matter angry white people do things to suppress again uh, whether that was jim crow whether it was in canada africville in nova scotia and i just i'm passionate about this and i really believe that we can all do better but step number one is we need to watch those counselors and uh, check out Progress Toronto and what they're doing to help interpret the stuff that's going on and shame on the mayor and shame on those 16 who voted against defunding the uh, police. That's all. That's thank, my thank rant. You. Thank you. So uh, we're going to go to the vote, but I'm just going to walk through a couple of things that, that uh, we've been working on. We had as, as, uh, Danica uh, said we we invited uh, you know leaders of our uh, uh, black trade union leaders in our movement uh, CBTU Urban Alliance and Race Relations Danica and Ainsworth as co-chair to meet with our executive board to talk about anti-black racism and 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 exactly how we challenge it. Um, this our labor council has been involved in in uh, police oversight issues for half a century, uh, and you know letters, uh, deputations, mobilizing demands. If you turn your mind back to when Julian Fantino was looking for, a, for a, a, a renewal and the right wing in council was going crazy and go, uh, you know, uh, going after David Miller because he wanted to end Fantino's uh, drive by you know, policing uh, style and move towards uh, more community policing. Our labor council mobilized for public meetings to raise up exactly what it is that would be required for a police chief and a police services that uh, would be responsible. We've been involved for many years demanding oversight. And one of the things people should know is that this, the setup is this, the provincial statute bars city council from actually requiring things for the police service, the police to do. The police services board can, can appeal a ruling of Toronto City Council to reduce funding for the police to a provincial unaccountable body and be overturned. The police individuals can refuse to cooperate with SCIU investigation of improper use of force because of the provincial statute. And the police services board, there's uh, provincial appointees because of provincial statute. And when Doug Ford got elected on his, on his election night, he said, I'm there on the side of the police associations and the and the you know the men in blue who are keeping law and order in our society. So city council has a small piece that they can do to provide guidance. The Toronto Police Services has a larger piece they, they can do to provide guidance. The chief of police can still tell the Toronto Police Services, thank you for your advice. 
I'm not going to take any of it. I'm going to run this service as I see fit because that's how the law is written. And it's the provincial government. As somebody said, you know, like a century and a half ago that set up these laws so that communities could not hold police accountable. This is 10 years since the G20. Everybody who was on that march, put up your hand. And just remember what happened at the end of that march, the largest mass arrest in Canadian history, people kettled who had nothing to do with rallies or marches. And if you want to get your eyes open, go back and look at the W5 uh, reprise of, uh, of that issue and looking at the interviews with, with people who, were, who had their civil rights taken, who were brutalized by police. We have to get accountability for the police services, but it's not just the city council. There's four areas uh, of power within policing, and we have to go after all of them. We got to be smart and relentless in moving this forward. So now I'm going to ask uh, for the vote to be put up on the screen, uh, and that is to support this as uh, unfinished business. And the statement is means that the business will continue to develop, will continue to mobilize, will continue to support community activism to demand true accountability and the police uh, uh, policing that is about community safety and other services that get funded instead of just the people with, uh, you know, who've got a gun in their in their pocket uh, or in their holster. Okay, is that going up? And after that, uh, we're going to do the Labor Day update, followed by the CLC very brief report, and then reports of unions. Is the vote up yet? Okay, uh, Susan, are you ready to give the Labor Day report? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. So I want to. We want to thank everybody for your input on Labor Day at the last meeting. We heard a loud call from you for a physical presence of some kind on Labor Day this year, despite the fact that we're not going to be able to march 25,000 strong into the CNE through downtown Toronto and an event that Maureen King organizes so well. Um, but we know we have to celebrate our collective strength. We know we need to keep demanding better for workers and for our communities, even though there are limits to what COVID will allow. So we discussed what you told us with our executive board, with heads of unions, and a number of our leaders also say their members want to get out there and have a physical presence. We've seen, and many of us have joined with the powerful protest marches challenging anti-Black racism. Yet we know that the possibility of holding an in-person event on September 7th is uncertain at the moment. And even if a, a parade or other physical activity is allowed, participation is expected to be lower than in previous years. So having another visible way of marking Labor Day, celebrating and showing our strength is critical. So here's our plan. Um, Labor Council on behalf of the region's labor movement would do mass marketing to get our message out. You'll see hopefully transit ads on the sides and backs of buses and streetcars for up to four works, weeks rather. Uh, we'll buy digital ads on Facebook, Instagram and other social and digital media. And hopefully we'll get approval to hang huge Labor Day banners over highways in the GTA, like we did, uh, but bigger and more legally than uh, the education cuts banners. We're also gonna continue checking provincial and municipal rules and best practices governing in-person activities. And if COVID restrictions permit on Labor Day, we would mass in our usual spot at University and Queen um, and uh, up for a shorter parade. We'd end up at Queens Park where we would have a short event to honor workers' rights and labor pride. And we'd live stream the event so that members unable to participate in person could join virtually. You know, we know that some of our affiliates will be reluctant to participate in order to ensure the maximum safety for their members. And we understand this and there, there won't be pressure to do that. Uh, and if in-person activities are not permitted, we're gonna consider whether things like car cavalcades can be done with the large number of participants we might expect. Um, Josh may tell you that to supplement this, the Congress plans a, um, a larger online event that workers across Canada will be able to take part in. Um, and finally, we're preparing a short video about Labor Day in Toronto, which the CNE has asked us to develop and then they'll feature it on their website on Labor Day itself. So 
Each of our affiliates is going to be asked to make the same contribution as last year's parade registration and to contribute financially for the marketing, perhaps from budgets that, uh, that you and your unions might have used for t-shirts and hats for your members. So in closing, we'll keep you posted on how the plans unfold. Thanks for your continuing support to make this year's Labor Day one that really counts. Thanks, Susan. And uh, of course, we did spend a bit of time in our chat rooms last, uh, you know, last month uh, talking about this. We had uh, this coming from our executive board, and then we actually had a heads of unions meeting last week with 40, or on Monday, I should say, with 40 uh, union leaders to unpack this potential. So please go back to your own unions and make sure that people are, are talking actively about how your union can participate, get those messages. We're even looking at banner drops across the highways, bus ads, all kinds of things uh, to make sure that we're celebrating Labor Day properly. Next up is the CLC uh, report followed by committee reports. So Josh, followed by any of the committees that want to report. All right, um, I'm hoping I can share screen uh, at some point. Uh, okay, well, I'll start, I'll start and hopefully in the next few minutes I'll be able to share screen with you all. Okay, I think it's, it's working now. Uh, so uh, just following up on, on some of the stuff about um, that we're dealing with in the world in, in, in Toronto, uh, the CLC did uh, have a anti-black racism uh, and the labor movement uh, webinar on, on June 12th or sorry, June 10th. Uh, about uh, 1500 people uh, attended that. Uh, I think it was a good start to, to some, you know, some real discussions that we need to have within not just our workplaces, but within the labor movement uh, themselves. Uh, a couple of things came out of that. People I debriefed with, with who attended the call is just making sure that there are safe spaces for, for racialized workers to, to be able to talk frankly about the issues they face within the labor movement. Um, so, so that webinar itself, for example, you couldn't make it an anonymous comment. Well, that's pretty tricky when you you know, maybe you're, you're, you, you know, you're, you're a member and you're, you know, your local president's on, on the same webinar and you're, you're a little afraid to say, speak some truth. So, so things we're looking at, um, we can always do better and grow. Uh, quickly, I'll just mention our municipal, our campaign to get more emergency funding for municipalities. We've been working with the labor councils across the province. Uh, over 52 uh, letters to the editor of various publications across Ontario have been sent into labor, uh, sent in by labor councils. Uh, labor councils have also sent motions to their local uh, municipalities about emergency funding. So in places like Halton and Niagara, all those municipalities have have actually passed motions, um, uh, you know, asking for that emergency funding. The last tool that we have, the latest tool that we have in this campaign, is that you can actually um, you can actually um, you can actually email your MPP uh, and you know you can actually email your MP and your MPP uh, based on your postal code so you can sign up for that um, anytime. Uh, next, I just want to quickly mention that we released a report last Friday on privatization uh, and, and privatization kind of is at the root or, or, or has something to do with all the things that we've, we've been talking to tonight. Um, so the, the, the 2017 convention of the Labour Congress uh, put together a task force. The re a report has just come out from that ta task force called New Forms of Privatization for the Public Good. Uh, you know, new forms of privatization have uh, are happening, including social impact bonds. Federal agencies themselves uh, are now facilitating privatization. Um, so things like the Infrastructure Bank, uh, FinDev, the Social and Finance Fund. Uh, so th this document, this report does actually go into a lot of depth about that. Um, it's important to note that that it it also acknowledges that you know in this pandemic the there's widespread uh, support for public services and but despite that you know the same corporate players um, that benefit uh, from 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 tax cuts and privatization are regrouping renewing their tax they're calling for budget cuts they're looking for ways to profit from uh, services that that need to be provided to to all people so for example. Uh, folks know the government of Canada, they awarded a $5 million contract to Amazon uh, uh, early in the pandemic, $5 million uh, to distribute PPE. Right now, there's a big major story in the news. Uh, you know, a charity has been, has been tasked with, uh, with, with handing out over a billion dollars in student grants, you know, and, and this charity has 
huge ties to the Liber Party, Trudeau himself. So, you know, the privatization is just is is ramping through every, in, in every facet. Uh, so check out the report. It's available uh, at the Congress website. Um, and 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 there, there there's a, a ton of a ton of a ton there to read. Um, so yeah, CanadianLabor.ca. Great, thanks, Josh. Are there any committees reporting? Uh, and then we're ready for union reports after that. Any of the committees? Not seeing any. Uh, uh, Govi. Um, hi there. Yep. From the equity committee, uh, we are currently uh, working on the IWALK podcast. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, IWALK was canceled this year. So we are currently working on the podcast. And also we were uh, reviewing some documents uh, during our meeting and we wanted to just put a statement there that uh, uh, be mindful for uh, committees that represented representatives from communities are and install members from the labor movement for um, different advocacy groups where possible. Is that okay? Sorry, that's it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other committees or reports of unions? Just put up your hand or uh, no reports of unions of any kind? If you're on the phone, I see uh, Kim Nacello. Kim Nacello? Yep, sorry, I had to unmute myself. No worries. So um, I'm local 5111 with uh, LBED, LCBO. Mm -hmm. So we are doing on July the 21st, we are doing a day, what we call a day of action, which is we are going, uh, we are in the Scarborough, our locals in the Scarborough area. So we're doing a day of action for, we're going to two uh, MPP offices and uh, doing a, uh, a human chain uh, with a, a pool noodle in between each person to for our social distance. Um, and then with, uh, attached to the pool noodle will be a sign of some sort uh, with um, uh, keep it public uh, with the, uh, hence the uh, uh, LCBO and uh, 15 in fairness. And, um, and uh, there's a few other ones. I don't know what uh, Janice uh, is uh, organizing a lot of it. Um, so if anybody has anything that they want on the sign, um, uh, uh, let us know, cause we can put it on our human chain. Uh, you can email me at uh, kim.local5111 at gmail.com. Um, so uh, we're going to be doing this <clears throat> again on July the 21st, uh, just to uh, promote awareness. Great. Thanks very much. And we'll try and put a, something on our e-blast around that. I have Kingsley Kwok next. Thanks, John. Um, at the Ontario... Public Service Employees Union next Tuesday, uh, June, July 7. Um, the union is hosting two teletown halls online. Um, it is to, to allow um, OPSU members and OPSU staff uh, to participate in a conversation uh, about racism and anti-Black racism. And um, we just released our uh, login details today and so uh, we had got uh, a panel going um, composed of uh, OPSU members and us and two OPSU staff, uh, all of whom are, 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 are brothers and sisters and comrades uh, who are black and mo with the moderator uh, Farley Flex. Um, it's going to be uh, interesting and I expect to be a lot of powerful um, conversations and um, I guess the next month I can report uh, on what OPSU is doing uh, following this Taylor Town Hall. Great, thank you. Any other reports of unions? Uh, if you're not able to put your hand up, you can just chime in now, because I know there's a couple of people on the phone and it may not be easy how to do that. If none, then uh, thank you, sisters and brothers. I know we did go on uh, later than we normally do, but we did want to give a chance for, you know, that our brother from Hong Kong to tell us what's dramatically there, but uh, 
we really needed to hear, particularly from our own, you know, uh, workers of color, leaders of color in our movement, uh, about the things that are happening, the hate crimes that are happening, the terrible incidents that all of us need to respond to, as well as unpacking the deep work that we hope to do within our movement through the Yes It Matters campaign. I do want to thank Faduma Mohammed from Labor Community Services, her staff, and all of the people who are part of that Yes It Matters advisory committee, and uh, thanking all the unions that you know have recently picked this work back up and endorsing the charter. It is an updated charter that we ask you to use. That'll be in the mail to your union, as well as it's gone out uh, or it's going out to all heads of unions tomorrow, uh, along with a reminder of the Yes It Matters plan of engagement. Um, on Monday night, your executive board is meeting with the board of the uh, Urban Alliance on Race Relations to talk about how we continue to move forward uh, on this issues of challenging racism. And as I said before, uh, later in the week, your labor council would be uh, deputing to the uh, Toronto uh, Public, uh, Police Services uh, based on the recommendations that is here. But this is very much unfinished business. And we hope that all of you can help us circulate this material to your unions ask them to pick it up and either endorse it or, or follow up in a way that shows the power to decision makers uh, at every level that we want a different kind of Canada and a different kind of world. Thanks again, sisters and brothers for joining us tonight and uh, stay safe and stay well with all of your uh, family. Thank you. Thanks, John. Keep up the fight. Thank you. Okay, have a good night.